Hey y'all, I'm Atticus, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore and the host for tonight's event. This evening, we are pleased to welcome N. West Moss to our At Home with Literati series in support of Flesh and Blood, Reflections on Infertility, Family, and Creating a Bountiful Life, a memoir. She'll be in conversation with Marie Myung Ok Lee. For our attendees, the chat is closed, but I will be dropping links to purchase Fresh and Blood from Literati throughout the event. You can also use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time. I'll ask a selection of them at the conclusion of the event. A reminder that you can shop for more books in store or at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup and shipping to your home anywhere in the United States. And now, allow me to introduce tonight's author and moderator. N. West Moss has published a collection of short stories and her award-winning essays have appeared in the New York Times, Salon.com, McSweeney's, and many other publications. She has a, she has a certificate in, narr in narrative medicine, excuse me, um, and works at the university in New Jersey where she lives. She has a middle grade novel being published by Little Bound Publishing soon, so keep an eye out. Um, Marie Young Oak Lee's next novel, The Evening Hero, is forthcoming with Simon and Schuster in 2022. She has written for the New York Times, Slate, The Guardian, The Nation, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, and Salon. She teaches fiction at Columbia, where she is writer in residence. The essay series she did for Slate is uh, on her son with autism with cannabis will, will be featured in Dr. Sanjay Gupta's CNN series, Weed. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to West and Marie. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. And I hope a lot of people will use that link to support this bookstore. Buy lots of books. <laughs> so should I just go ahead and, and read a little excerpt, Marie? All right, I'll start with a little, a little excerpt from Flesh and Blood. Um, it's two chapters, which might sound long, but these chapters are half a page long or a page long. So this is uh, chapter 26 called Checking Under the Hood. And it's after I've gotten diagnosed, but before I'm going in for surgery. So today I take my car in to get an oil change. It's the kind of task I can still do because it shouldn't take me far from home. And I'm trying to get everything on earth taken care of before surgery. So I take my car to a place three miles from home to Josh, a guy I know and trust for an oil change a thousand miles early and they can't open the hood. It's been a problem for a while, but now the problem has come home to roost and I need to face it. Time has run out. Next, I take the car to a body shop 10 miles away and the guy with an oil smudge over one eyebrow can't open it either. I have this stuffed down frantic feeling that I am going to get this motherfucking hood open and the oil changed on this car no matter what it takes. I'm not going to leave this mess for after surgery or for someone else to deal with. So I take it to the dreaded VW dealership where everything costs a fortune and for $302 plus tax, they open the stupid hood. Chapter 27. My doctor called after I got home from the hood odyssey to answer my one week before surgery questions. I'd been looking at material online about exactly how these vaginal hysterectomies are done. And it looked to me as though they'd cut right through the cervix to get to the uterus, but I wasn't sure. I'd been thinking that a vaginal hysterectomy had such a quick recovery time specifically because it did not require cutting through any muscle fiber. But I'm pretty sure the cervix is a muscle. So I asked him, will you cut through my cervix? I'm removing your cervix. He says it like it's obvious. And it is in the definition I found, so I guess I just didn't take in the meaning. But I feel like someone should clarify these things for us lay people. Why do they assume we know things that we couldn't possibly just know? 
Jesus, I hadn't expected that they were going to remove my service cervix. Like a door slammed, I flinch. I don't think I will miss my uterus. It's problematic, diseased. I've never seen it. But my cervix, my cervix, I know with my fingertips from situating my diaphragm there back in the 80s. And now it will be gone. A piece of me that I can visualize will be gone. This feels different worse than the actual hysterectomy, which carried almost zero emotional baggage. The silky, slippery nose of my cervix, who never did anything to anyone, cannot apparently be saved. And for some idiotic reason, I'm sitting here, alone in the living room by my bowl of popcorn, feeling horrible, as though I have not been a good steward for my body, as though I can't protect this innocent, almost creature from the onslaught. The day is a bust. I won't be able to sleep now, and even worse, although they got the hood open on my car, I never even got the oil change, because sometimes even the smallest things are so much harder than you expect them to be. Ah, uh, thank you for that. I love this book so much. I'm really glad you read um, that particular piece because uh, I love that phrase "stuff down feeling so much. It's kind of, I, it's just kind of something like getting on a Zoom, getting your oil changed, but then it, it, it ends up being so sort of expressive of wanting to control something that you can't control. And so much of this book is, is a journey of figuring out what you have to accept and then what's under your control and then finding out so much of it actually, if I'm correct, <laughs> isn't under your control. Right. Um, so I want to start from the beginning. Um, so here's this beautiful book. And the how did, how did this book come to be? Just like, how did this... How did you decide you wanted to write a book about this? Well, I, I imagine you're like this maybe, or other writers are like this. I don't really know, but I have always written even as a little kid. And uh, I tend to not write about the easy times. I don't write things like, well, today was a nice day. It's usually when I'm grappling with something confusing that I'm trying to figure out that I use my writing to try and make sense of the world. It's almost like a kind of uh, exploration and then a validation of what I'm going through. So I kind of validate myself that way. So um, when this happened, uh, the last part of the book is in Holland because I went to Holland and you were there for part of this. <laughs> and I was, I remember very distinctly, I was working on a draft of this. I was, I, I decided I wanted to write about this experience. Um, I was writing long form really for successfully for the first time. And uh, I was trying out these really, really short chapters. And I remember coming downstairs one day and saying to Marie, I don't know if you'll remember this. I don't know, it's coming out so weird. It's these tiny little chapters and I've never written it this way before. And you said as a good friend, um, let it be what it wants to be. <laughs> And I went back upstairs and kept writing it. Um, so, so it was, I guess, originally to uh, make sense of it myself, also to um, to try out long form. I'd always liked writing essays, but this had, you know, illness in a funny way has a really nice frame because it has this uh, symptoms mystery diagnosis, and if you're lucky, uh, getting better after after you know healing up if it's something that isn't chronic and so that seemed like a really good frame for me to use and it gave me space to kind of go off on lots of little tangents within that framework um i also you know when i was going through all this it became very clear that there was nothing out there that i wanted to read that would help me through what i was going through there there's very little literature, number one, written by women. Um, and the only things that seem to have gotten published are 
um, horror stories about hysterectomies, these very intense, extreme experiences. And as I started to do a little bit of research and realized 600,000 women in America have hysterectomies every year, I thought, I want to contribute to the language around this. And I want to just have it be the, the book that I couldn't have when I was going through it and kind of a friend just, just tried. It actually was very hard to write in a way that would feel as though I was just talking to a friend rather than writing for a large audience. But um, that was part of the challenge. Um, to, to write the book that I wished I had had and, and have it demystified at least one person's experience, just kind of like, let me tell you what it was like for me. So it doesn't have to be such a, such a haunting, mysterious, unknown. And, um, you know, I, I'm hoping a lot of people will add to the language around this. So it's only one person's language, but, uh, you know, not only for me, but also for people like my husband who would like to be able to talk about it, but we don't, you know, it's so weird and taboo in our culture to talk about anything sexual, much less infertility, uh, hard enough for me, but I think in some ways, maybe even harder for the men in our lives. I'm not sure, but I feel like there's almost no language for, for my husband to bring it up with anyone. Um, so there, that now, as we're talking about it, now I'm realizing all these reasons that I wrote it. Yeah, that's really cool. Cause I have, um, so I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit because something that you said is making me think of, um, the extra expertise that you bring because you have a certificate in narrative medicine. Was this something you specifically did to help you with, an, with this, or was it something just part of your own interest? You know, it was part of my own interest. It, they, they're, they're related in that um, narrative medicine is certainly, uh, uh, there's an interest in the patient experience and the, in, in, and the interaction between clinicians and patients. Um, so there's definitely overlap. But no, I had been, before I wrote this book, um, I had been writing a lot of short essays about things like a miscarriage that was in the times or um, sort of just infertility in general that was in salon. I had written about my father's illness. I had, I was very interested in sort of the lyric side of medical writing that I love the beautiful language uh, that you can use in literary kind of fiction writing, but I kept being drawn to medical issues. And, and as uh, I, I started also getting asked then to, uh, like I, I got to participate at University of Virginia Medical School uh, with their medical students as a visiting scholar because I had published in there, they had a literary magazine, which was so cool. It was kind of this new thing um, that there are these great journals out there like theirs and Bellevue and, and uh, BLR, which I think just celebrated its 20th year. And Danielle Offrey, who's the editor there, blurbed the book. It was, that was all really cool overlap. Um, so it was because of that then I was hanging out with doctors from Univers University of Virginia who had kindly invited me there. And they knew about this new certificate program in narrative medicine at Columbia. And so it just ended up being this amazing experience where I then got to talk to lots of clinicians already well into their careers, you know, um, attendings and RNs and stuff. Um, that then, you know, it, it just, it was stuff that, these were interests that fed off each other. And then I got to teach classes on death studies and all sorts of cool uh, medical humanities kind of kind of courses. So it, the interest, I guess, what is a writer, but her obsessions, right? We, we are obsessed with words and images and subjects, and it becomes what we, what we write about, I guess. Well, that's what's so interesting because this book kind of skirts um, memoir, like sort of your personal experience, but also kind of almost edging into, well, Let's see, this, the subtitle is Reflections on Infertility, Family, and Creating a Bountiful Life. Um, so it kind of 
um, is skirting like almost genres. So I'm kind of curious if, so when you were writing it, you knew that, you know, you were writing your art for you, but was there also some idea of a specific audience, like infertility, medical, or even, I'm kind of half joking, but like eat, pray, love audience, or is, did you actually have an audience in mind, especially once you were talking to the clinicians and seeing, you know what I mean? You might be seeing yeah. like what they're missing that you feel like you could offer in a book. You know what I mean? Cause it's an, yeah. in a way it's like a clinical book as well as like a lyrical memoir. And that's kind of an interesting like place to be. It does have a lot of weird, different uh, personalities to it. And I, I did not start thinking about audience while I was writing it for sure. But then when, um, I had an agent, I, I think I got the agent because in my query letter, I mean, I got the agent because people were kind and introduced me to great agents. And, but in the query letter, I included some of the statistics. Um, and I think that that is what interested I mean, I hope he was also interested in the writing, but I think he felt it was marketable because it's this huge void in the market. And I don't, I don't know. We'd have to ask my amazing editor at Algonquin, Amy Ash, if this is, you know, if, if that was, I know that was partly how my agent pitched it. I do think it helps knowing that there are so many people who've gone through it and there's nothing out there. However, I did not write it in that, with that in mind. Um, I wrote it uh, so that maybe people going through it could feel less lonely, really, right? Um, so I think it's cool that it worked out that way, but I did try really hard, and this is maybe the hard thing that all writers face, to, I considered my audience in that I tried to make each sentence beautiful, right, and and clear. Yes. I tried to convey what I was trying, trying to convey to total strangers, but I wasn't trying to create something that was sellable, and that's a fine line, right? I figured I'll leave the commerce to the people who, who know commerce, and I'm just going to really try to remove myself from that and there were a lot of conversations about the title and the subtitle because that also is up is part of the marketing. In a funny way, having the word infertility in the subtitle it can it can almost limit the book. Maybe I love the title, but I but I wonder sometimes if someone looks at that title and thinks, "Oh, this is a book about infertility." So either it's going to be really sad or it's just going to be for women, um, which is also okay if it's just for women, but I really want to invite men into the conversation. And I also feel like a lot of the book is funny and circumspect. And um, while there may be parts that seem sad, I also feel like it, it kind of skirts some of the boundaries of genre too. Oh, definitely. Like there's, there's some chapters that feel a little bit like prose poetry maybe, or that was my hope. And um, some that feel more like essays and um, so it's a weird little creature. And the dialogue is excellent. Good thing you have such good memory for your mom's dialogue. Cause your mom is also super funny. She is super funny. She's hilarious. And I hope, are you here, mom? I can't hear you if you're here, but I think she's coming tonight and, uh, she's 88 now. And she, she does have a real specific cadence to her voice and she has read this. So, um, she gave me the, okay. We had some hilarious moments around her hearing loss where I had to scream things at her for her to hear them. And we would just laugh and laugh and laugh because, you know, it's not nice to scream at an 88 year old woman, but <laughs> we had a good time together, even despite the reason that we were together. It was quite a beautiful, um, unexpectedly lovely time together, but. Well, that leads to my next question. Exactly. Because it's kind of funny and shocking and there's humor and blood and, you know, you kind of are very lyrical, but unsparing with ac what actually happens. Yeah. So, um, so let's just talk about just memoir in general. So, you know, what, what do you do? Because memoir is, is about things that are three dimensional. So what do you do about people that you write about 
three-dimensionally are going to possibly read the book or be hurt by it, or you're seeing them in ways that normally people keep to themselves <laughs> or just tell us what's it, what tell us about like, what's writing memoir about when you know the people and they know yeah. you. And they you know, I think memoir is tricky, but I think fiction is tricky too. I just read an article that you posted um, about good art friend. I just skimmed it because I think it just came out. <laughs> Um, but right, it's very tricky. Even fiction writing can can cross a whole lot of boundaries. And um, I will say this, I'm lucky in that I come from a family of artists and uh, my family has always said to me, write whatever you wanna write, write about whatever you wanna write. Um, that being said, when I, anything that I've written that involves the family, I've let, people in the family read first. I do feel like I have plenty of stories I can tell. And if anyone ever said, don't tell that story, I'd be fine with that. And so I go into it with that, uh, particularly with memoir. So um, my first essay about our miscarriages that ended up in the New York Times, I, I, I let my husband read it. Um, because obviously this is his story too. And um, I said, you know, the same thing. If you don't want me to publish it, that's fine. And uh, he said, I want you, he read it. And he said, I, when we first learned that the, there was no longer a heartbeat for the fetus, he said, I didn't gasp, I sighed. So he asked me to change that one word. And I thought that was a really writerly kind of an edit. And he was right. Hmm. But other than that, and other than my mother thinking I swear too much in my writing, I haven't had to make many changes. I also though, um, like for all my doctors in here, I just use initials because this is not me settling scores with doctors. Mm -hmm. I loved my doctors. We had a hard time, but this is not about, I don't need anyone to be mad at them or any of that. So I just used a first initial from a last name and I also left out, a lot of people told me their stories and I have siblings and I specifically decided to completely avoid bringing in anyone else's story. Mm -hmm. I just decided I'm not going into if someone's married or not married, has children, doesn't have children, had an abortion, didn't, you know, I just decided I have my story to tell and I can do that without invading anyone else's story. Um, and that, and, and, and as a result, I didn't, there are very few even names in any, in any of, of the book. I just sort of leave it as my sister, my sister's boyfriend. And that was a much more comfortable place for me. So um, I think, you know, there's a problem in writing sometimes where we try to settle scores in our writing. Uh, and I think that's always a bad idea. <laughs> for me, it comes out as bad writing and, um, and I don't think it's that interesting to readers. And so um, I, I feel like my story is enough and that's the story I, I like to explore. And I do the same thing in fiction, by the way, right? Sometimes I have bad guys in my early drafts that resemble people like an ex-boyfriend or something. That goes away after a bunch of drafts. I don't need, and in fact, there was a chapter that I cut out of this book that was about people who eventually, who who sort of were um, unfortunate guests. Like there were friends who maybe said the wrong thing hmm. or did the wrong thing. And that was in there uh, for a bunch of drafts. And at a certain point I thought, you know what? I'm starting to hate that. It sounds mean. And um, I took that chapter out. And I, I actually, I like that you kept, um sort of the people, not vague, but the story, you kept it more your story. So it became much more of an ensemble. I actually felt like that made it easier to keep track of who everyone was versus- Interesting. Yeah, I like that a lot because it was okay. your, it's your ensemble of your life. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of people are really interested in writing memoir and I know that you teach memoir. So I'm just kind of curious about like how you teach the form and then also, you know, how do people know everyone's life is really interesting, but how do people know if their life is interesting enough to write a memoir, I guess is 
<laughs> yeah. You know, I think these are good questions. And I, uh, I have students all the time, maybe you do too, who come in and they say, well, I don't know. I don't know about your experience, but I often get, get students who are like, just tell me if this is worthless. <laughs> they come in oh, wow. feeling like worried about that. Um, my feeling is every story has been told and that our job as writers is to tell it in uh, the way that only we can tell it. And so you have to really work at your writing to find your voice in that way. So in a way, I feel like my, my little memoir could be about almost anything. And maybe you could even make the argument that it's not even about infertility. It's about a happy marriage and trying to kind of convey the subtleties of that or the ways that the natural world are redemptive um, or the idea of legacy and or or the ideas of um you know, how we pivot to use a word I kind of hate, but how we turn away from failed dreams, which we all have dreams that we don't make happen because not everyone gets to be an astronaut, right? Um, but how do we sort of take that, uh, that thing and make a different life? So I, I don't think it's so much about whether we have an interesting life or not. I think it's, do we have something to say about our lives? Um, that makes a good memoir? Do you have an opinion and something to share that hasn't been shared? So I think any story can be told beautifully. I could write about um, the death of a loved one in a way that's horrible and cliche and doesn't make people feel much um, or feels like something they've read before. Um, or I could write about it in a way that's fresh and exciting because I'm bringing my own um, my own powers as a storyteller to bear. I'm trying really hard to make it something special. I think probably the biggest mistake I see with beginning memoir writing, which is correctable, I think, is that uh, sort of discussing with the writer the difference between writing for your journal and, mm. and writing for a larger audience. Like that's a pretty big difference. And I think that can be clarifying for a writer that, you know, if this is a story that you're writing because you want your inner circle of family to know that you came over to uh, America from somewhere else and, uh, and you went through some hardships and, and you're not that interested in craft, I would say that's very worthwhile, but it's probably not going to be uh, published by a big publishing house because it won't have a wide interest and audience interest outside of the people who love you. I still think it's worthwhile. I still think that's a kind of legacy and I encourage people to do that. I've, I've worked with senior citizens and um, veterans and with prisoners to write their stories. There's something very valuable and potentially cathartic about that. But if you want to write a memoir that's going to be published, then it has to reach beyond um, just the uh, the small circle of people who love and care about you. And I'm not saying one is better than the other because I don't feel like it is. Um, it's just a whole different muscle. So that, you know, if I, if I have a story I want to leave for uh, my family, I might write uh, five or 10 drafts of it. But this book I probably wrote 50 drafts before I got an agent and I've probably written another 50 drafts with my agent and with my editor and mostly joyfully so because we kept refining and refining in a way that I found very pleasurable but I don't think most people like that you know so uh like like that process unless you're a writer and then you like that process so it's so there are different reasons for doing it um but I think anyone's story is worthy. And I also think that um, most people think that writing is something you're just kind of born knowing how to do. And when they realize that it's a craft that you can improve on through hard work, it's a great, that's a great thing to learn. That if you work hard at it, you can make your stories more resonant for people and more original and um, that that work is worth it.
Nah, I like the Thomas Mann quote that a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than for normal people. <laughs> yes. That's kind of, uh, that's my uh, deal I with like that. that. I like that. I need to put that up here somewhere. I remember that one. So the other sort of interesting um, book that you're, this book reminded me of is Oliver Sacks' book, Gratitude. I couldn't find it in the mess, but this, his book is also like, um, physically small. So like, here's my little phone. So you can see the book is also somewhat physically small. Um, and, so, and some of the, the way it's written with a short chapter. So I'm just curious to hear you, um, talk about why, like this, the idea of a physically small book. And was there like an artistic decision in that? Well, first of all, I love Oliver Sacks. And I've never read Gratitude. So now I have to order a copy of Gratitude from Literati Books and have it sent over post haste. Um, because so I always pictured this book, you know, I, I, I've had another book published. I have other books coming. This book was probably always going to be my most personal book that I care about the most because it's my own story. Um, I always pictured this book as being tiny. I wanted it to, like, I'm excited that it's hardcover. I'm excited, uh, you know, the way the cover feels. I love the art of Raul Colon, who um, did the original painting. This is just a piece, a, a detail from a larger painting. Um, I wanted it to be the, the word that kept coming into my mind was I wanted it to feel like an artifact, like this little treasure that people who were going in for surgery or who were recovering from surgery or from an illness could carry with them and hold in bed without being large and heavy that you know, when you're not feeling you well, mean like, you don't, uh. <laughs> yes, like I don't want to be crushed in bed. I, I mean, there are certain books. I read plenty of books that crush me in bed and um, I'm there for that too. But when you're not feeling well, it felt like the short chapters were also part of that illness mindset. My mind was not functioning long form when I was unwell. It was, it was really functioning in these tiny little doses. And so I never said, I don't think I ever said to anyone at Algonquin, I hope it's tiny. I'd like someone to be able to fit it under their pillow or bring it with them to the hospital or, or fit it in their backpack or their purse, but they got it. There's a lot of white space on the page. Like I just opened it to this. I don't know. Can you see that? This is very typical. There's short chapters and lots of white space. And I really, really love that because I don't want it to be intimidating physically. I want it to feel like if you're lying in bed and not feeling right, you can read two pages and feel a punch from it, um, but also then just put it down and let it sort of work on you. So I kind of love that it's tiny. And when I finally saw it, I was like, it's exactly, it's exactly what I hoped for. They did. Oh, it. I love it. So you didn't it's even have a discussion about it. They just kind of read your mind. They kind of read my mind. And I mean, I, I, my experience with my editor was was one of the most magical things I've ever had. So I feel like somehow she got into my brain and knew that and somehow told everyone else there that that's what we wanted. Um, I guess that's what a good editorial relationship is like. You just spend a lot of time together um, and you get weirdly fond of one another or I'm I'm weirdly fond of Amy um I can't speak for her but yeah so they kind of intuit a lot and also you know I don't think she would have bought the book she clearly understood the book from the beginning right she understood what I was trying to do and so it really shouldn't be that much of a surprise that uh it translated into the book I was trying to make it into she got it and uh it made the process a, a pleasure for me. Well, let's talk about your fiction for a minute. So was there ever a, min a moment that you thought of writing this as a novel or how, did, how do you decide what form something's gonna take? I never thought about that with this. And I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I write, I write across a lot of different genres. I'm working on a play. I've written middle grade fiction. I've written short stories. Um, this felt uh, 
This felt very naturally memoirish. Of course, the hard part about it being memoir for me is, and I've seen a few people think it's quite graphic um, in certain places. And um, my counter to that is, well, if we can watch all of these shows on TV where women are getting murdered and chased and beheaded and we see cadavers on CSI, how can frankness about our bodies be considered a bridge too far? So I'm hoping, I know what they're saying. We live in a culture where hearing about menstrual bleeding right there is too much. Right, we're not even allowed to talk about that without it being perceived as too graphic. And I understand we are we are sort of um, affected by our culture and the taboos. I don't like those taboos, so I decided to flout them. I decided I'm going to write it the, again the way I would tell a friend about it without being ashamed. Um, and if people couldn't couldn't feel comfortable around that then maybe this would move them an inch in that direction. Maybe they could see themselves and the, and the people they love. Um, so at any rate, this felt pretty, uh, pretty clearly nonfiction. The one thing that I was nervous about was talking about religion because I am an atheist. And I know I've, I reveal so many things in this book. My entire anatomy is discussed. Um, but the one thing I've been uncomfortable with is 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 revealing that I'm not I, I'm an atheist, that I'm not religious in that way. And I thought, oh, that's the most revealing thing in this book. That also speaks to cultural um, taboos. And so for some reason, that was my most nerve wracking thing. I am excited, though, to be going back to fiction because I love I'm really looking forward to a different kind of freedom with fiction and that I can hide and I can play with character and, um, and invent. Uh, so I'm looking forward to doing more fiction and I'm working on fiction and I love it. But this, this there was never a moment um, that this felt like it should be fiction that I recall, unless you remember me saying this should be fiction once and then I believe you, but I don't think so. No, I think, I think the great thing about it too is it would be great going back to religion and the female anatomy. It would be great if they made a lot of these really religious men who always make pronouncements about women's bodies and they don't seem to know which end the blood comes out of that. That would be nice if it, it's astounding to me how much people who make proclamations do not seem to understand female anatomy or even right. Right. miscarriage, infertility, like what a miscarriage mm -hmm. feels like or right. just the things well, women go through. That was really interesting to me because I had never understood, even though I know people who've had miscarriages, that at a certain stage of a pregnancy, if you have a miscarriage, you actually go into labor, right? And that, that so I lived through that and hadn't, why, why on earth couldn't I have known that beforehand? Well, we don't talk about that kind of thing. Um, and so we're not allowed to know, we're supposed to feel ashamed about it. Well. I'm here to say, don't be ashamed. Um, also, you know, what was interesting when I was doing research just to, to build on what you just, your comment, Marie, was that um, when I spoke to a doctor friend and I said, uh, you know, I just read you the part about suddenly realizing they're taking my cervix, a friend of mine who's a doctor said, you know, it's only recently that they started taking the cervix. I don't know how recently. Um, he said, you know, it used to be that the church preferred it if you left the cervix intact. So they would go to great lengths to leave the cervix in so it would um, feel the same for the man when they're having sex. And it's actually quite complicated if you think about it, not to get too graphic, friends, but right, the cervix is just a piece of the uterus. It's the neck of the uterus. So imagine you take the whole uterus, but you then cut the cervix off and sew it back in. So, um, so that it feels the same for um, the man. It's, it actually is much more prone to infection apparently and all sorts of interesting things. So it certainly is, um, I, again, I just think it's, it's a delight to be able to just say 
say the words and let people cringe a little bit if they need to, but also maybe uh, make it, each time we talk about it, it's less nerve wracking for everyone. And more people in our lives can talk to us and share these things. That's, that's my hope. Definitely. There's, a, there's such a raw empathy in the book that I just feel like anybody could get something out of reading it, whether you have kids or not, or if you're in, interested in fertility, or if you're a guy. I mean, it's just, that's the interesting thing about it, kind of skirting these genres. It's really just about life in general. And that, yeah. Um, so I guess before we go for questions, then the last thing I just want to ask is like, what are you working now on now? Like, do you have any idea for your next book or? Well, I'm, I'm really starting to feel like I need a residency somewhere. Like I need air to breathe. I need, I need, um, I've been on residencies. It's where I met Marie and met some of my most cherished friends are at artist residencies. And not just because I want uninterrupted time to work, which I really, really want, but also because being around other artists is magic and changes the way that I feel about my own work in a way that it just doesn't happen in, in other life. So I have a million ideas and a million projects, but here's what I have mostly working on. Um, I do have this middle grade novel that Christy Ottaviano at Little Brown has purchased. It's called Birdie and I'm very excited. It's finally public because I'm so excited to work, go back to work with my new editor there on those characters. Um, these are characters I love. And um, I can't wait to get back to them. But I've also started a novel for adults um, that has sort of a working title of Thursdays at Shea Josephine, which is sort of a more New York and suburbs. Uh, but uh, the two books that I've been reading to kind of get me into the flavor of the book are uh, Confederacy of Dunces mm. and Portnoy's Complain. Wow. Which I know are kind of weird and edgy and um, charged kind of, um, but also funny. So that's, that's where that book is, but I need, that's what's up on the wall there. All the, the sections that I've been working on are up on, on that. Are they that little, board. are they chapters or like scenes? Um, they are chapters. And then you kind of, I don't want to unplug my computer by accident, but um, those white cards are all the characters cool. that I'm, that I'm developing. So that's really, that I feel like is a, that is an important book that I definitely will write and that I might need more time than sort of half an hour in the mornings to work on because it's complicated and ambitious. Um, I'm also feeling like I really want to learn how to write plays. I just read a book by James Lapine about working with um, Sondheim on Sundays in the Park with George. And maybe it's the pandemic. I don't know how other artists are feeling. I really want to collaborate. And so theater seems like a great way to work with other people, um, to hear, to let a director affect the work and let the actors change the story in some way. Um, so I'm sitting in on a theater writing class right now, a script writing class, because I need to learn more about how to do it. And I have a friend who said he's going to try and teach me in January some more um, detailed stuff. So I'm working on on that. I'm just draft doing wow. a first, first draft. But I'm using the characters from the novel for that so that I'm getting to know them better as I'm as I'm working on that sort of one act play. It's almost like a study huh. for the novel, which right. is fun too. So yeah, I'm working on, if I had if I had a couple months somewhere, I don't think I'd be coming out for dinner much. I have a lot of what to do. I have a lot of what to do. Play, sure a script, too. another novel, children's book. Yeah, and exciting. you know, it's a weird thing. I'm, I've never been in this particular position ever in my life, but... I've got two publishers who want to see whatever I write next. And it feels urgent to me because I've never had that before. It's, it's an amazing moment. And um, I would like to take advantage of, of people who, uh, not take advantage of people, but take advantage of the fact that people want to see what I write. 
it's it's a dream come true. So I'm really trying to get up at four in the morning and do my writing and write on weekends. Um, and sometimes I'm a little more successful at that than others. I get tired and, uh, you know, but yeah, it's, it's exciting. I have, I figure I have about seven more books I'd like to write. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Don't be all actuarial about it, but congratulations. Cause this book is amazing. Thanks, so I Marie. think we get to, um, I'm so happy to be here and part of your early launch of there'll be many more events, I'm sure. And it well, looks like we have some questions. Oh, all right. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question from Marco Guerrero. Um, and it's, I might have misheard, but why exactly did you make your chapters so small in length for your book? I made the chapters small for a couple of reasons. It's a, I, I sort of started to answer it, but I didn't get all the way through it. So it's a good question. Um, first of all, when I was, I, the book is about this sort of unexpectedly lengthy illness and recuperation. And one of the things I was interested in exploring is how um, my mind changed when I was unwell. And it really did change. And I started perceiving uh, quieter things that I hadn't noticed before. Um, and I really slowed down because I had to. And I, when I was reading, as I'm always reading, I stopped being able to read books. And I started reading poetry, because my, my brain was sort of able to work in these condensed, imagistic ways, but I couldn't really hold on to plot over a hundred pages, you know, that was too much for me. But I, I remember we, someone, my friend Florence sent me a book of Yates and someone else sent me Mary Oliver, who I'd never heard of before. And my mom and I would sit and sometimes just read a poem and then just, I'd go back to sleep. That was enough. Um, and so I was trying to approximate in the short chapters the brain, my brain, when I was unwell enough to think long form, if that makes sense. Yeah. One, can I ask a follow up question? Do you mind? Sure. Um, when working on a project that um, it both has these kind of short little bite sized moments. Um, and, and it being longer, um, in the sense that this is a collection of these little moments. Um, how do you find closure as an artist? Um, I think especially with the work that's so personal and so weighty, um, revisiting it every day in these little moments, um, I imagine could be, uh, difficult emotionally or maybe, maybe not. And I'm curious. You know, one of the funny things I remember saying to my husband after like eight kajillion drafts, well, I'm finally sick of my uterus. Like, you know, you, you kind of talk about catharsis. You work your way through something that's so painful at the beginning, but as you're revising and revising, it, the, the emotional charge for me really um, began to go away pretty early. And I started thinking about the art of it, right, the, the, the craft of writing and shaping. And um, so at one point it was just sort of a series of things about the illness. But then as I was writing, I kept thinking about more things like the women who came before me and how present they had been for me when I was sick and healing. And I decided I wanted to work that in. It's almost, you know, not to overstate it, but it almost feels like writing uh, a symphonic piece of music, right? Where you kind of get the melody first and then there are all of these other storylines that accent and work in harmony and counterpoint with the melody. So, um, you know, my husband, uh, the women who came before me, uh, the natural world, legacy, all of those things became more interesting to me when the emotional charge of the actual illness and fertility had really waned a lot. And I, and I realized there's other stuff that was going on for me that I haven't explored. Um, the ending, like all endings, I don't know. I think everyone 
I hope everyone has this problem. Endings are hard. And um, so I, that, that took me a little while to figure out the ending, but uh, we got there, we got there. Well, there's a, there's a question that's on a similar note from Martha Witt. Uh, do you think Martha? you might write another memoir? If so, would it be on the same topic or do you feel you have exhausted that? What other memoirs do you want to get out? Oh, Martha, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I have to have a talk with my agent. He wants to have a strategy talk because he thinks I should write another memoir. And I did think for a while that it might be interesting to write about my ancestors in New Orleans because they are quite fascinating to me. Um, and I have a little bit of information and have done some digging at a great place called the Historic New Orleans Collection and Archive in New Orleans. And I've done some digging there. Um, I do like writing the short sort of a creative nonfiction essay form a lot, but I don't have a memoir specifically in mind, maybe because I've, I'm just coming off of finishing this one and I'm feeling like a palate cleanse with some fiction. Um, but, you know, it's funny that Martha's asking that question because I think she was one of the first people who ever said to me, you should write a memoir. This was long before I felt I could. So she knows things I don't know. And maybe now I have to go write another memoir. She thinks I should. Martha knows best. Martha, she does. And she would agree. She does know best though. She does. She's smart. Well, we probably have time for uh, one more. I'll um, be quick then, okay. <laughs> um, there's a question from Jacqueline. Um, what has been your biggest surprise after publishers became so enthusiastic? Thanks and mazel tov. Is the question is what was most surprising when? Say uh, that again. Yeah, directly worded. It's what has been your biggest surprise after publishers became so enthusiastic? Well, I mean, publishers being enthusiastic is a surprise right there, and very exciting. And I guess I was nervous when. Um, before people outside of my family had read the book, if it would move people. You just don't know after a while, right, when you're working on it. Um, so it has been a delight. I have started getting, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started hearing from total strangers on social media who had gotten to read advanced copies and found me because they're going through something, surgery, for it, some are for are fertility related, but others aren't. And that the people saying to me, the book was a friend to me. So it's a surprise, but it's also what I most fervently hope for. So it's a nice surprise uh, that it seems to be mostly landing in the way I hoped it would land with people as a, as a, as a friend. I want the book to be a friend to people. And clearly it is. Clearly it's becoming that. Which is nice. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're close to the top of the hour. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been an honor, uh, and West and Marie. Um, so thank you all for joining us on At Home with Literati tonight. Uh, thanks to all of our viewers and make sure to buy fresh and blood the link is in the chat thank so, you thank you thank you literati and thank you marie for always being so such a huge support you're amazing buy books from literati okay <laughs> bye, thank you blood. okay have a good night y'all good night